Um, I also wanted to, to introduce something very br briefly that everything that's said here today is the opinions of me and Russell and perhaps some of the participants here. We do not work for the IB and this is not an official IB workshop or production of any type, okay? You can save your cheers for later. <laughs> Uh, so right now, um, we're going to, we assume uh, this workshop is aimed towards people who are new to the program. And so I'm sorry if you're a veteran and some of this is redundant. You'll have to get over that and participate a little bit later uh, with advice and things of that nature. Okay? All right. So we're going to look at the, um, the actual... I need to present now. I think we're going to look at the actual guide first, and then I'm going to view my entire screen. We're going to go here. Um, can you see? I don't know what you're seeing. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, we can see. Oh. Okay. So um, here we are with the with the guide, and we're going to look at paper one uh, briefly at this. If, you're, if there's anyone, um, I can't see anything, so Russell, you'll have to tell me if it's so. If anyone's teaching prescribed subject one, can you give some sort of indication? Maybe just jot a point in the, um, the chat window. It's an interesting topic, but rare to teach, I have to tell you. We're going to go to prescribed subject two, conquest and its impact. It's all about Spain killing people and invading other areas. So if you're teaching that, let us know. Uh, if so, you're one of the very few people doing it. One of the most popular areas of, of paper one, due to 700 different reasons, which we'll get into some other time, uh, is the move to global war. And this, of course, overlaps well with paper two and three. And of course, a lot of people have some knowledge and there's lots of sources and textbooks, uh, one of which I'm familiar with, especially. Uh, so we're going to look briefly at the content of this before we go to <coughs> the next two prescribed subjects, which are also popular. So basically in this, uh, like all paper one subjects, you have a, a sort of a bipolar approach. Uh, we are really interested in, an, as IB teachers, in, in perspective and also making this an international course. So you have here a case study of, of I don't know where that went, but that's a case study of Japanese foreign policy that may or may not have led to the first, uh, sorry, the Second World War debatable. And then, of course, German and Italian expansion. Um, so you've got an Asian approach and also um, a Central European um, area to study. So it gives us those two, two uh, zones. So in terms of, you'll see that these are all broken up into three subtopics. So causes of expansion, events in that expansion, and responses. Um, if these are actually responses, another debatable thing for historians. But for, uh, and that goes for both. So we have a way to parallel teach or to compare and contrast as we go throughout the course. Um, Russell noted last week, and uh, I believe, and then I'll uh, say that, is that uh, as exams come around, you only get assessed on either case study one or case study two. You don't really know which one you're going to get. So it's just always a surprise, and you have to teach both. So um, I can't see anything here, but I assume there's no questions about content. We'll move on to prescribed subject four, which is actually quite popular as well. This is rights and protest. Case study one is about the American civil rights movement, and case study two about apartheid South Africa. Um, and again, divided into three subcategories, nature and characteristics of discrimination, protests and action, and then the role and significance of key actors or groups. You have that on both case studies so that gives you that uh, not only in uh, two regions, the Americas and uh, Africa, but you also, of course, can, can compare and contrast these two movements as they go along. And finally, uh, prescribed subject uh, five, conflict and intervention, which is also uh, somehow popular, and I'm so glad for that. Uh, one of them is Rwanda, and again, uh, that's case study one for Africa, and then case study two, which is Europe, uh, and that would be Kosovo. Uh, so causes of conflict is a subtopic, courses, course and interventions, and then impact. Uh, these are really pretty basic and easy to understand. And I'm going to unpresent now um, so I can see if there's anything we need to talk about here. So I've stopped sharing. Can you all see me now? Okay, I see thumbs up and... No projectile vomiting at this point. Um, so if you have any questions about that, can you type that into the chat window? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I think it's very important that all of you have a copy of your guide and that you use it. Um, 
Russ and I have noted several times that we get a lot of questions, uh, not here, but in the forum um, of my IB, but also on uh, the Facebook support group, that we get a lot of questions that are pretty easy to answer if you take a look at that guide. So if you don't have a copy of it, you can get that from my IB. So I don't see any questions about content. Uh, let's take a look at what a paper looks like. Okay, and we have a 2018 paper, and that is provided to us today by Russell. So Andy, having a hard time with that bar down there. Can you see it yet? Okay, cross your fingers. It worked. Okay, it's just about to present, yeah. Is it up yet? Yeah. Okay, uh, I don't know if you've been through exams or not. Uh, if not, here it is. You have uh, two, two things are with you, uh, your students, not you. And that is a source booklet with all the information that the students will work with on their exam. And then, of course, the exam questions themselves. It's very important that you train your students how to use this book um, because you want to save time, you want to reduce their stress, and of course they should feel confident. So just the, the instructions are very clear, but it's as, as a teacher I often forgot to go over those with the kids, frankly, poor children. But it's important that you do so. So do not open the booklet until you're told to do so. These are the, all the same for higher standard, it doesn't matter. Uh, read from one prescribed subject, not two, not three, not more than one, and so forth and so on. Some of the uh, editing, they explained that, but the kids should already know that from your instructions of how this is going to work. We're going to go down to uh, prescribed subject three because that is usually the most popular for questions, uh, sources I through L for the questions that are appropriate on the next booklet. So let's just move down there. Um, we're can, still moving. And here we are. So you have here a source, well, I, from Jonathan Spence, a historian writing in the academic book, The Search for Modern China. And of course, kids will work with that. And there's some blather down here, which should probably be up top, but that's another story. Um, then we have Source J, yet another book. I find it interesting. One's called a specialist history, history book. The other one is um, an academic book. If anyone knows the difference between those two, please let me know in the chat window. Uh, we also have two sources that have been left out in the um, copy. It, the students would have had that, um, but when they sell these exams, they they don't re they often remove artwork because it's very expensive um, to buy the copyright. So if there's any questions about what this looks like, you've got four sources. Um, Russell, can correct me if I'm wrong, but usually there's uh, one um, visual source. Is that usually accurate? At least one, yeah. At least one. Yeah, uh, there's, but, yeah, there's always usually. one, but and sometimes two. But I think it's very uncommon to have a second one. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it would be usually one. Okay, so now we're going to go to the um, second paper, which is not that one. And here we go. These are for the questions. Can you see the questions? Yeah. Russell, they came up. Yep, they're there. Okay, so we're going to questions 9 and 10, and so your students, of course, you'll train them to go directly to the right questions. If they answer, if you're doing a question, move to global war, you, you just tell them the question 9 is always move to the global war. It doesn't change, and it's part of the strategies and coaching we'll talk about later. So um, these are the type of questions that we have. Um, you may or may not like them, but this is the way it's always going to look. So... Um, Russell, how are we doing on time? A couple of minutes, one or two minutes. Okay, uh, so you'll always have four, and the first question is, is uh, has two questions. But this is uh, Russell's area to present, so I think you should go ahead and do it. Um, I think okay. we're, we're doing okay on time. And yep, that's about right. We're aiming for a 17.30 before, so we start looking at the questions themselves. All okay. right, so if you, would, if you want to stop presenting, Andy, for a moment. Yeah, let me figure out how to do that. Um, Bottom of the screen. And Stop presenting. I, that, even it. I can understand that. Okay, okay. here we are. Okay, Go ahead. great. Okay, so uh, Andy's given you an overview of the, the paper, and I've just put into the chat window uh, that you should really take the opportunity to go through one of those full papers, and, and it will reinforce the fact that you look at questions one, two, three, and four, and they're always exactly the same format, which is
which I think is great for the students. I, I continually remind them, look, you know exactly what to expect. For, the, for your source work paper, 1A, 1B, 2, 3, and 4 will always be in the same format. Russell, I've shared a, a Google Drive link to this uh, assessment. It also has the mark scheme in, in that folder. So feel okay. free to, um, to use that if you'd like. Yeah. So everyone, you can uh, you can see that in the, the the chat window there. I've actually put together a little presentation as I want to focus on uh, the rights and protest option. So Andy, as I've mentioned in the chat, is the expert on subject three. So what I'm now going to do is just bring up um, a PowerPoint presentation with you. So if I'm waving my hands, I've got a fly or bee buzzing around my head in my back garden here. Um, I'm in the south of France, by the way. I didn't put that into the chat window, but I'm in sunny Toulouse at the moment. So I'm now going to present. Um, my entire screen. Hopefully this is now about to appear. Just allow and fingers crossed that I'll be able to bring up my... Uh, hang on. So hang on, hang on. As, can you see, Andy, if, I'm, uh, if I've got the presentation up yet or not? It's, it is uh, trying to upload um, or open. It hasn't, for, hasn't yet for me, but do go full screen this time if you don't mind. Yeah, I will do, but as soon as it's actually there, I just want to check that it's actually presenting. So can you tell me if and when uh, it stops spinning the beach ball of death? I'll let you know. Okay, so I'm hoping. It says I'm presenting to everyone, so with any luck, you should be able to see my screen. So can anyone give me a thumbs up if they see my screen or shake their head if they can't? Thumbs up from Erica there. Looks like my screen is there, so it should be that you are seeing my PowerPoint presentation at the moment. Is that the case? Sorry, just iron this out. It's not up yet, no. It's not up yet. Okay, so let's just try this in a slideshow from uh, the start. Has it come up yet? No. No, what's going on here? Okay, give me a moment, give me a moment. So it says I'm sharing my entire screen. I'm going to stop presenting, stop presenting. All right, try again, present now my entire screen. Allow that, go to PowerPoint, fingers crossed, from start. Right, has it appeared yet? Yep. Hurrah, excellent. Yeah, okay. congratulations. Okay, so um, Andy, you'll have to be looking at the chat window here for me and do pitch in when you can, because I'm on full screen here so that uh, I can just get a nice big screen on there for you. So let me know if any questions come up for the next uh, 10 minutes or so on my clock. All right, so in terms of timings, that this is what I recommend for the, the four questions. And I'll put this presentation onto um, Google presentations later so you can consult it later as well as the video. Um, and I've just heard someone's trying to join. So give me a second. I need to let someone just gone to try to join. Right, Ben. Right, there we go. Sorry, I want to go back in. Can, I, can you still see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Okay, so um, timings. Never Question mind. One. We can't see it now. Right, I lied. Right. Okay, if anyone else beeps to try to join now, I'll have to just uh, not let them in. So just give we me can, a second. We can see it now. Thank you. Okay, so question one, 10 minutes. Question two, 10. Question three, 15. Question four, 20, which leaves five minutes for checking. So that's what I recommend they do. For my students, whenever we do a timed source work exercise, and I always do them in timed conditions in class, setting a lesson aside, the first thing they should do is just put the time of the clock next to each of the four questions when they're aiming to finish. Unlike paper two and three, where they've got two essays, paper two, three essays, paper three, it, it's more difficult to divide the time between these four questions, especially as it's only one hour. And what you often find from my experience is that some very good students will simply overrun by a few minutes on questions one, two, and three. That eats into incredibly valuable time for question four, the big mark question. And as a result, they underperform. So I find that one of the most important things to teach the students is that timings. Another point for you to note, which isn't on this slide, is that in the real exam, students have five minutes of reading time in the real exam. Um, so although I put five minutes for checking, usually in a classroom environment, they use that five minutes to be doing their reading. And it's important you do build that into your preparation. Don't just chuck the paper at them and say, right, exam starts now if you're doing it in class. Give them that five minutes. It gives them the chance to just skim over the sources, settle themselves down, get to the right part of the paper, as Andy said before, if you're using a real exam paper, and just familiarize themselves with the questions that, that they're coming up. Okay? So those are the basic timings. Am I okay to move on, Andy? Yes, I just want to confirm that that five minutes reading time is essential yeah. um, for, for every reason, psychological uh, or whatever. But they should, uh, you should train your students to use that five, time, uh, five minutes to read the first question and read the first source that's needed. 
so that when it's time to begin the exam, they can just pick up their pen and get writing. Yeah, sure. Uh, another thing to note here is that if you get used to using those timings, you can regularly be doing a source work exercise in class as part of a lesson rather than the full lesson. So you could set the last 10 minutes aside for a question one style question, for example. If you do, you know, full tests are really useful, very, very helpful. Um, but you don't want to just do one of those every few weeks. It's quite handy just to build once a week a little source work question into a lesson in time conditions. So they just get used to the time demands. It also reminds them how little time they have to write. You know, they don't have to over write for these answers. Anyway, let's look at, sorry, Andy, you got something to say there? Uh, just briefly, I wanted to say that I would use paper one style questions for the in, uh, for the entire course that you're teaching, not just necessarily for move to global war or uh, civil rights and apartheid or whatever. Just constantly use it. If you're studying something authoritarian states, then fine. Uh, give a sample question one or a sample question two. Uh, so yeah. they practice these skills. And this is really about skills and not about content. Exactly. I think um, a couple of people who were planning to attend today just asked that question about, you know, when do you do the source work skills? And as Andy says, you do them all the way through, not necessarily every week a full paper one. You're never going to do that. Uh, but what you want to do is just keep on practicing those questions. And we'll talk a bit more about that towards the end, where I'll mention how students can design their own source work. But for the moment, if we look at question 1A, it's always in that format. And again, reassure your students. It won't, there won't be any hidden surprises. They're very predictable questions although the content, of course, changes. So why, according to source X, did, and that's for three marks. So you see here, this is the framework I give to my students to work with. You know, you're not going to win a Pulitzer Prize for your answers. What you want to do is just give an answer that the examiner can clearly understand. The examiner wants to reward the students for what they say, and the best way to allow them to do that is to ensure that the question or the answer is uh, structured appropriately. So as you see there, just the first reason is, the second reason is, the third one is. Now, for each of those three ideas, you give a statement and then a brief quote or detail from the picture source if it's in that format. So if you look at an example at the bottom there from the Middle East, for example, which is from the old syllabus, in fact, uh, one reason is that Eden was afraid NASA would damage the British economy. Then in brackets, we cannot let him have his thumb on our windpipe. Now, what you don't say is one reason is that Eden didn't want NASA to have um, his thumb on our windpipe and then quote, we cannot let him have his thumb on our windpipe. You know, the statement has to reflect some understanding of the quote that follows. You can't just quote from the source and say one reason was, quote, that's not enough. You have to demonstrate understanding. Now, to illustrate that point, um, here's an example, which I'm not going to have a chance to go through in great detail now. As we are tight on time, we want to make sure everyone's got a chance to answer questions or ask questions a bit later. But if you look at this one here, this is from uh, Rights and Protest. This is one I designed myself. And I'm in the habit of designing um, these exercises myself and getting the students to do so. But it basically is an extract from Rosa Parks explaining why she didn't give up her seat on the famous bus or the infamous bus. Um, it's a good idea for the students to read the questions first before they read the source that corresponds to them. So they know what they're going to have to do with them. So what, you've got to identify three reasons that she was able or wanted to give up her seat. So here is the answer. Now, as I say, I'm going to share the, this presentation a bit later with you, so don't worry that you haven't had a chance to read through it in, in full depth. The important thing is the answer, of course. So if, if I just read that in full to give the idea, one reason why Rose Parks refused to give up her seat is because she had just completed a day's work at a tailor's assistant and felt she wanted to sit down. Secondly, she'd sat down on one of the vacant seats for black passengers, but had nevertheless been asked to stand up and let a white man take a seat when the whites only area had no seats left. And thirdly, when the driver threatened to call the police, she decided to make a stand, quote, you may do that. Finally, most importantly, she was fed up with the whole principle of segregation, quote, why do you push us around? There's actually four points there, of course, um, but you've got five minutes or so on that question. And it, it's not necessarily that you have to stick to three points. I'd recommend if the students have identified a fourth, get that down too, in case one of them is a little bit weaker and the examiner doesn't want to give you credit. Is that one OK? I completely agree with that. OK, let's look at 1B. 1B is just for two marks. What message is conveyed? And in a similar sort of format, again, give the examiner what they want very explicitly and clearly. One message is because the source says or shows something. And a second message in the same format. We need the second slide, um, Russell. The second slide, what do you mean? Uh, 1B, question 1B. That should be on the screen now. What's on your screen at the moment? It's 1A still, sorry. It's oh, 1A. 1B is okay. popped up now, thank you. 
Is it now there? Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, right. So again, I put there at the bottom is explain and then quote. So once again, give a point of view and then show your workings. A bit like I always say, it's a bit like with your maths. It's not just about the answer that you give at the end. It's about showing how you got to that answer. So here's an example. Has that appeared, Andy, that cartoon? Yes, just now. Okay, great. So what message is conveyed by source C? You have to identify two messages. And here's an example of a picture source. Um, again, this comes from one that I put together myself. As Andy says, the sample papers often don't have the actual images, so you have to design your own. So there is the source. Just give you a second. See if you can identify two points, perhaps yourselves. If you were going to say what two messages are given by this source, what might they be? I'll move on in just uh, 10 seconds. I hope you're not asking me that question. No, I'm not. I'm just asking generally. But the, the point is, it's, a, it's usually a, an obvious big message jumps out. And if you did GCSE or similar, it's a similar sort of thing. Well, there tends to be one very obvious message that you can deduce or infer. And then you have to dig a little bit deeper for a second one. So this is what I put anyway. The overall message of source C is that every generation and every individual should stand up for what's right in order to secure justice for everyone. This is indicated by the references to the contributions of Rosa Parks sitting on a bus and Martin Luther King Jr. Martin, marching on Washington and Selma. A second message is that this struggle has been an immense success, with its most recent manifestation being the election of a black president, Barack Obama. So is that OK? Very good. Thank you very much, Andy. You're welcome. And uh, if we look at question two, again, if anyone's got any questions about these, just be popping them into the, the chat window for the moment. We'll be answering those as we go. In the last part of the session, we will just directly be talking, having a proper conversation with people, I hope, as well. We have a question. Uh, for, okay. one, for 1A, is direct yeah. quoting necessary or is paraphrasing from the source acceptable? I think, I think paraphrasing the source is acceptable, but I'd always encourage a direct quote if I could, because if you are you're effectively paraphrasing when you give your explanation of what the quote was, if you sort of mean. So if you make your point about the source, if it's a written source, a brief soundbite. I tend not to use the word quote with the students because students tend to see the word quote as meaning an extended sentence where it could just be a word or two. So I'd say there's, you don't have to quote, but I, I'd personally recommend it. So explain, then quote. What would you say, Andy? I think quoting it is more time efficient. Uh, and it should be, as you said, very short, uh, four or five words at most, um, and that's it. But yeah. uh, stronger students will find it easier to paraphrase just because they interpret the quote differently. So it's a case-by-case -case basis, but for students who uh, need more time to say, you know, know what it means, but just go ahead and quote it just to, to move on to the next question. I find paper one is really about time management and often less about skills. So. Uh, that's my approach to this paper, which is not very academic, but um, the students I've always taught ha are te speaking English as a second, third, or 45th language, so it's it's often easier just to quote things direct instead of sitting there pondering a, a paraphrase. Sure. Okay, I'm going to end by looking at question two before I hand over to Andy for three and four. So question two is a real mouthful, but it's always the same again. That's the point to tell the students. And this one is a classic example of how it helps to have a framework for answering the question. So it will always say, with reference to origin, purpose and content, analyze the value and limitations of source A or B or C for a historian studying whatever the topic happens to be. So I always said, the students, when they first see that, are kind of like rabbits in the headlights. They say, where do we even start? There seems to be so much to cover. So I give them that following framework that you see hopefully on your screen there for question two. So I would say start with the origin of source A is. From this, we can deduce that its purpose is. Therefore, the source is valuable because, for example, in terms of content, it, and then focus on terms of what it says, the attitudes revealed by the source. Nevertheless, it also has some limitations in the sense that, for example, in terms of its content, and then focus on its factual omissions, maybe, and unfair prejudices from the provenance. So it's all about provenance, it's about content, it's about value, it's about limitations. And that framework, I find, is really helpful for the students because, as Andy says, it really is about time management uh, in paper one. They've got a very limited time on each of these questions, and they don't want to be chewing the end of their pen, asking themselves whether they've covered all of these various bases. So I just give them that three-part structure to start with, of course, as they get more confident, as time wears on, 
they start to take the stabilizers off their bicycle as it were and we'll, we'll get a little bit more free and easy with their answer but if they get too free and easy i'll tend to rein them in and say hang on it's all about just giving the examiner that o p v c l uh, i think it's the case that the examiners are encouraged to actually put those letters in the margin as they're marking the answer where it used to be to illustrate that those have been used so andy yeah i was i would say that um I like your approach very much, and I think a, a template is important. Um, I tend to have the students, uh, of course, discuss origin, purpose, content, but in two paragraphs. So I have values in the first paragraph, limitations in the second paragraph. Um, and then when, um, and we would, I would coach them that once, you know, you've dealt with the values and the limitations, I would actually underline the words, you know, um, its its value or its content or its limitations. I just underline it because frankly, I don't always trust the, the examiners. So I make sure that's there and I, and I have the kids do that also for themselves and make sure they have dealt with origin, purpose and content for both value and limitations. Um, I don't know yeah. if that's helpful to anybody, but that's how I approach it. Well, I mean, that leads me onto my final slide, I suppose, which is-, is Even better. Well, not that one there where you can see I'm doing a similar sort of thing really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, very good. You can see there that you can either approach it row by row or column by column. So I was talking one thing through and Andy was just doing it the other direction around. But absolutely right. And the idea of underlining so those keywords, O, P, V, C, L, you know, the origin, the purpose, the value, the limitation, the content. I think that's very good advice. Now, we, I'm conscious we're tight on time there. But so I'm going to hand over to Andy for three and four. But when I share the presentation with you um, on the, the web page, which I'll share with you later on, as I upload the video too, you'll see that once again, I've given an example, this time from rights and protests, but the South Africa study. So with reference to its origin, purpose and content, analyze the value and limitations of Saucy for a historian studying the role of women in the anti-apartheid struggle. And then once again, there is a separate answer there. And if I just give you a moment to, to look through that as Andy gets ready for three and four, you should be able to spot that I've used that exact format. The origin is, Therefore, we can deduce its purposes. It's sense, therefore, in terms of a value, is this, and its limitations are that. I'll just leave that there for, for 30 seconds before I unpresent. I didn't follow Andy's advice of actually underlining each of those words, but uh, that might be a good tip for the students. Andy, if you've got something to say there, I'm just about to come out. Uh, and... No, I'm ready to present what little I know about the question three and four. Okay, I'm just admitting a couple of other people. Okay, so I'm just going to stop presenting there and then back over to you, Andy, to talk about three and four. And I'll, I'll just be focusing on the uh, the questions on the right-hand side for the moment. And Please do. Interrupt me at any time. Can everyone see the um, prescribed subject three? You can give a yep. thumbs up and Russell will tell me it's working. It's that. Okay, great. So question three uh, is, a, is a very typical type of question um, on a paper. I'll also say I absolutely hate this question. I think it's the hardest thing to do in IB history. Uh, compare and contrast what sources I and J reveal about political instability in China up to 1941. The reason I'm reading this question to you is that it's really about not comparing and contrasting two sources. It's about comparing and con contrasting two sources about something. And so a lot of teachers and a lot of students uh, forget that. So you need to do it with reference to about political instability in China up to 1941 in this example, okay? So um, in terms of question three, there it's really often about format. Uh, uh, I recommend that you have a, par a paragraph of comparing the sources and a paragraph of contrast. It is very important that your students do not make a list, uh, like a bullet point list, it should be just forbidden, uh, but also that it's not just source A says this, source B says that, source A says this, source C says that. Instead, we, we do it all together. So while source J states this, source K disagrees and states that, so you, uh, would, you might even make a, a quote in that, but that would be a contrast, for example. Uh, if you're doing the compare, which are the similarities, both sources I and K agree that, in this case, uh, the Chinese uh, were in Shanxi 
province which, which gave advantages. Uh, source J indicates that this happened, but source K fails to mention that, that fact. So you'll end up with two paragraphs. They'll probably have about three sentences each. Three compare, three contrast, although four and two is an option in the mark scheme. Um, but you really need this um, double jointed approach to answering that question. And again, it's re in reference to whatever specific topic they're talking about. I really think you should never allow bullet points, not even as a, a practice, is this is a skill that they have to develop. And I think most kids find it challenging. In, fr in fact, I often find it challenging. And when I was giving uh, IB workshops, a lot of teachers struggle with this themselves. So it's important you practice and maybe practice with your students uh, when you're doing it. It could be a good homework assignment to give them um, to give them some time to deal with it and to get used to it and then just speed it up as you go along in time. Um, Russell, was that enough on question three? Yes. Sorry, it's okay. just me to my I microphone. Thought maybe I lost everybody or they all ran away. Okay. Any, any uh, other suggestions, Russell? Um, no, I mean, I've got my um, grid, which I could I could share a bit later on. And so I'll, okay. I'll just go back to that briefly later. All right. Uh, going to question four, which is, again, um, an essay question. Let me reduce this and go back to the exam. Using the sources and your no own knowledge, uh, discuss the view that Japanese aggression furthered political instability in China between 1931 and 41. So regardless of what the sources may say about whatever, it's the view that Japanese aggression further political instability. So we need to make sure that the essay that they're writing addresses this question. Um, so that's that sounds sort of pitiful, but it's also uh, a fact. A lot of students get in a hurry and don't finish the question and end up doing something else. So that's, of course, my first item of advice. We're looking for three to five paragraphs. Of course, stronger students will be at least five. And but as Russell suggested, about 20 minutes. Is that accurate, Russell, for your timings? Um, for question three. Four. Is this, question four, four is 20 minutes, yeah. Yeah. 20 minutes. So you, it may be, you may have less time because students may have spent more time on another question. Um, but it is important to do several things. Uh, first of all, is to organize something. It can be brainstorming, a basic outline with an argument regarding the question itself. So they have to come up with, oh yes, Japan had a great a great deal to deal with that. Um, and so we'll have to use examples, but that way we know what, how we're gonna use our uh, sources. They're gonna argue for that, or if a source is wrong, we'll say why. So uh, own knowledge is crucial, and it's something that you would necessarily have taught them, and it has to be included. I, I never, thank God, um, examine paper one in the past but what i do know is that people often tell me who are examiners that students often just start listing sources before they start the essay so say source one says this or source f says that that's not what this is about this is an essay and the ref uh, the the um the source of the material is inserted here i think it used to be five sources now we're down to four thank thank the lord so um, again, you're looking at the sources and not just necessarily inserting them. Weaker students will do that. Uh, stronger students will say source K uh, indicates that this was really the issue and blah, 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 and Japan had this and the other. So it's very important to actually talk about the source and not just throw it in there like machine gun fire. Often what I find is trouble because of time management, maybe, is that often kids don't have a clear conclusion to their essay. They may have, may or may not have stated um, what their argument was in the introduction, uh, but sometimes they just don't do the conclusion. Either they ran out of time or forgot to do it and were completely exhausted. Um, while we're on question four, and, and I don't have an example for you to think of, but um, I would say that um, students should be really looking at their question for until the time is, is called to end the exam. They really need to be looking at that and making that stronger um, and so forth. So I think that is it for that. Um, I just have some advice generally, but we'll get to that in a minute, I believe. So I'm going to now stop presenting. And I'm here. That was um, lightning speed. Does anyone have a question about that? Because no one's chatting today like last week when we were bombarded with questions. Well, what I'm going to do, Andy, is uh, just bring up the, I'm going to share again now my my uh, sheet here. So if I just give you a second, just tell me if this Word document comes up. 
which is my crib sheet that I share with my students. So is that visible, Andy? Not yet. Um, but I will tell everyone that this uh, crib sheet is a, is some sort of epiphany. Yeah, it's up. You just need to expand it to full screen. Okay, right. So at the moment, uh, yeah, because I've got notes on there, but if I just uh, just expand it out like that, it's about as good as I'm going to be able to get it, I think. Is that is that a bit better? Okay. Uh, not yet, but it's the internet is be delayed a bit today. Sure. So uh, what you should be able to see then is this, this crib sheet here, which again, it, it's freely available on my website, and I'll... I'll provide a link to that when I email everybody after this session. I'll, I'll show you where the, the, uh, the actual uploaded video is and all the resources from Andy and from myself, the PowerPoint and this sheet here will be shared with you. So don't worry if you're, you're not taking it in now, there's no need to take furious notes. But we've already talked then about questions 1A, 1B and 2 with me. Um, with regard to question 2, I've given you some further examples here. And if we move over to question 3, Andy was talking about um, the compare and contrast question. And in yeah. the chat window, yeah. someone was asking whether we need three comparisons and three contrasts. I don't think the mark scheme is explicit about that. We'll just say it's development points, you know, developed points about comparisons and contrasts. Um, so just make sure that you've got a couple of good comparisons and contrasts. In terms of contrast, as Andy says, the contrast might simply be that one source deals with something that the other one doesn't. Um, but even better is where one source says something the other one just directly disagrees with in terms of approach. And as with my other questions that I shared with you earlier, here there's a how to write the answer for the student's approach, okay? Um, another point here for question three is there is no need to explain why they agree or disagree. And some students miss that point. They'll start explaining why these two witnesses contrast or disagree about their perspective on events. That's not relevant, it's not necessary. They get no marks for that. They're simply outlining what the agreements and disagreements are. For the final one, for question four, my personal tip would be that whatever the question is given in terms of, you know, to what extent do the sources agree this or that, um, of the sources, there'll be one or two that agree, there'll be one or two that disagree, and then I always encourage my students to look for the golden source, I call it, which is the one which kind of provides the synthesis judgment, which explains why there's some sort of disagreement or a more rounded judgment, you know, the source which says, well, in the short term, that statement's true, but in the long term, it's not. For this group of people, yes. For that group of people, no. Economically, yes. Politically, no. You get the idea? But most of the sources will be pretty clear-cut yes or no. And there'll usually be one there buried by the examiner, which is the one they're looking for, which helps provide them with a conclusion. So it's not that there'll be two for and two against and the students have to sift through for their own conclusion necessarily. There's usually the golden source, as I call it, which helps them. So I say to the students, just go through and put a smiley face if it agrees against it, a sad face if it disagrees, and then put kind of like a wobbly face for the, you know, the golden source, which provides you with your synthesis judgment. OK, but that that grid there. I always share with my students, they always have that to consult the day before they've got a, a source work exam, just to remind them they don't bring it in with them. I always encourage them from the outset to try and be clear on that, unless they're very early on. Maybe the for the first one or two practice exams, I'll say you can bring in the crib sheet, but then for the second one, you can't bring it in uh, and you have to try and you know, commit to memory how you need to go about these questions if you can. But just two sides, quite helpful for the students just to have that framework for all those reasons we talked about earlier with regards to the timings and so on. OK, um, right. Beyond that, I'm just going to stop presenting there. And that uh, just enables me to, to bring up the, the tiles of everybody again. So I'm just going to change the layout and just give a couple of final points before we just throw it open to the floor, as it were, if you've got any direct questions so we can actually hear your voices. And it's not just been a monologue from, from us lot. Uh, but I did mention it earlier, but I, I, one thing I'd recommend is that you encourage students to always, well, you develop the source work skills regularly all through the course, as Andy says, even if it's just one question a week or just a practice question two, practice question three the following week, practice question four the next on whatever topic you're studying at that point, be it paper one, two or three three. I know that some people, for example, they get that paper one topic out of the way quite early on in the course. And there's a danger then that they don't revisit those skills for a very long time, which is, is quite a danger. Um, that's not an issue for me well, in my curriculum map. But Andy? There's, the, there's the opposite issue often that your paper three, in terms of chronology, might come first. And so you, uh, you might end up uh, using your paper one skills towards the end of the course and so they are still fresh and, and raw and have not had ample practice which was often yeah. my problem um, 
and Confessions from the Dark Side. Um, yeah. Russell, I had, a, I had a, an extra slide here with some suggestions for teach effective teaching, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, sure. And it, trust me, I'm, I talk very quickly, so this won't take long. Um, and I'm going to share again. And here we are. Tell me when that's up and running. Just about to appear. It's there. Yeah. All right. So uh, Russell's already talked about the uh, has suggested breakdown of timings per question. You are free. You are free to develop your own timings, and it may be that um, you decide that the fourth question is more important and give it thirty minutes. So just be, he has a great suggestion, and I like that. But you can do your own um, and have some ownership of that too. I would suggest paper one, as I did earlier, qu type questions for the whole course, the whole time. Um, I think that teachers and students might want to come up with sources and questions together um, as an as a, as a exercise in class or for homework or for group work, and then give those assessments out in class for other groups in there. Um, that's the same thing for three and four. A peer assessment, I think, is very important for kids to exercise those skills of, of what the examiners are looking for uh, and to give each other helpful advice. And I think using the, uh, the mark bands is very important. Um, generally, uh, in all in all of these areas, I think, of course, historiography is something um, I'm. I really like questioning everything. I think that makes uh, content a bit more rich and interesting to students. And of course, is um, is a, a good uh, practice of, as a historian. So that might be somehow a way to enrich your course. It's really about for me about perspective. So if you're using, uh, let's say, move to global war, and you're talking about China and Japan, try to get some sources from China and Japan on the subject, not just British or American or Canadian sources. Um, a game that you might want to do is is match content with provenance of the source. Okay, where's uh, this is the source? What is this talking about? To get used to working with sources, scaffolding is what we've been talking about the entire time. Um, again, as someone who's taught uh, in the non-English speaking world for decades, literally, I think it's important that you not take uh, just assume that kids understand what things like compare and contrast might mean. Um, um, so just think about breaking down those, those vocabulary just to make it a bit more accessible. These are my suggestions in 10 seconds or less. Um, and that was into that. So let me now unpresent. I mean, one final point I would make before I ask if anyone's got any direct questions is that it's a really great idea to a design your own papers if you get the chance, or get the students to try to design them. It gets, it gets them thinking a bit more about the mark scheme and what the demands of the questions are. And when you do these timed examples with your students, I'd recommend you always write the answers yourself with them if you possibly can. I know it's tempting just to get some other stuff done while they're quiet for an hour if they're doing a full one. Um, but it's really great if they can see you doing the answers as well. And then afterwards, you can share those on the screen, talk them through. You don't have to make them perfect. You know, I'll say, look, this isn't a perfect answer. I'm not saying I, I, I'm a genius at paper one, but I've got some idea how the mark scheme works. And you could even encourage them to kind of uh, poke holes in your answer. You know, so ask them if they could recommend any improvements. So you're sort of working on it together. I, th I think they find that really helpful to see that you can actually uh, you know, walk the walk as well as talk the talk. It's also right. a good it's good for formative assessment, so you have an idea what the kids are able to do, and if you need to adjust your teaching. Yeah. Right, so at that point, that leaves us with a, around about 10 minutes where we like to just ask if anybody's got any questions they would like to ask. So if you if you do, you can either put your thumb up if we can see you on the screen. If, you, if we can't and you want to ask a question, just uh, pop your name in the, the chat window and we can answer those questions directly. But, and similarly, if at this point you feel you've got all you need to get and you want to be logging off and enjoying your evening then give us a wave and thank you very much for joining us but now it's over to you really it's just free and easy any questions let us know or just i mean by all means simply take your microphone off and ask directly right savita has just asked for i mean savita do you want to just ask that question so we can hear some voices other than our own Savita's shy. Right, so Savita's asked for practice questions. Where can we get quick excerpts? Well, if you um, if you speak to your IB coordinator, you should be able to get a full database of past exam questions from years and years going by. I mean, the most recent incarnation was 2015-16. So uh, there's the May and November sessions. And so you should be able to get hold of loads of different excerpts in that particular manner. That's, that's where I tend to go for the, in the first instance. Savita, I don't understand your second comment for history texts. 
if you're looking for recommendations of history textbooks for paper one, uh, I'm very happy to recommend one in particular, but I think you should ask that question on the uh, history forum, because um, I'm very biased towards myself. Um, but in terms of if you're looking for source material to create your own exams, um, I do that often through Questia, uh, which is a database that you should, uh, your school should be subscribing to, in my personal opinion. Um, but really anything, JSTOR, Google, uh, Google Books, your school's library, you can find all kinds of materials. I mean, with that, the, the question there about, uh, you know, in terms of comparison and contrast questions, any suggestions from Kate there? I mean, I, I, it really depends upon the particular topic area. I mean, if, if you had a particular topic in mind, you could eat, just ask directly and we might be able to get back to you on that. And we did mention last week, actually, which worked quite well, is that if any questions occur to you after we log off today um, and you've got a particular question you want to ask me or Andy, by all means, uh, email us directly. You all should have my email address, I think. But if not, I'll be emailing you all after this session with the links and then you can come and uh, just email us directly with that and we can then get back to you in due course. So I've been answering some emails today from people about last the last webinar about curriculum maps. So yeah. We have a question from Tatiana. Thank you, Tatiana. I'm not gonna answer that question. Um, we also there's have- no, There's no debate to be had, Andy, that's why. Oh, that's, no well, no. that's it, it's- um, Yeah. But I'm, I'm, thank you for that. Sorry, I, hi, I'm actually interested. I have all the different textbooks here and sometimes I'm just confused. I, I mean, all textbooks have the pro and cons. I just like to hear from you what you think, what are you doing differently than Oxford or Pearson? Like, what is your emphasis? How did you approach the textbook for Move to Global War? Um, I know the authors of the, of, the, of the other textbooks and I really don't want to uh, say anything about that. But um, I will tell you that I am very much into research. Uh, I know D David Urbanski is here. We've had some debates on the history forum, which I enjoyed very much. Uh, but I have, um, I use my university library at Vanderbilt University and I spend about six or seven months writing a textbook um, and it's an intense process. Thanks, uh, thanks, David. I'm glad you're smiling. Uh, but it, um, it's, uh, I find it very enriching. Uh, I do know that the Pearson books they are very good as well. Uh, I think Cambridge University books are pretty good. My main irritation are the Oxford University press books, uh, and, the, and it's not because the authors are not doing their thing. I think that uh, there's a, less editing involved in some of those books, so they don't often flow. You might have nine or ten authors, and it's a bit di it's, so it's several voices there. I think that might be the issue. But anyway, I I enjoy writing very much and um, trying to be helpful. And um, not everyone who's under my leader, uh, under under me in my school think that, but that's another story. Um, I think um, Kate, you were talking about sources. I think we answered that. Um, talking about the challenge of funding sources. There's literally more out there than you think. And again, you, your school probably has electronic databases to find everything you can imagine um, um, there. I use Google Books, I use University Library, I use a question like a religion uh, and so forth and, and so on. David, I'm not gonna be uh, dragged into a, a, a debate today because I've been on a construction site 12 hours a day and my hair's falling out. Uh, but I'm very happy to have that anytime, any other thing. Uh, David um, is not the greatest fan of AJP Taylor or um, uh, Richard Overy. And, and all of you as historians understand and know that historians use evidence and they measure that evidence. So Taylor makes an argument and then uses evidence to prove he's right. And just like you do as historians, if you're writing something. Um, so let's... Uh, We'll, fight, we'll continue debating about that until we're dead because that's what historians have been doing for thousands of years and so on. Um, but yes, uh, Russell, we're not getting into that today. All right. No. Um, there's no other question. This, this is overlapping incidentally in paper one with what's no doubt going to be a subsequent webinar on the internal assessment and what I've been doing uh, recently. I mean, what I found last year when I often have my internal assessment marks moderated in a random manner, and I'm sure I'm not alone there. And I'm always kind of thinking about, right, how do I 
try and maximize their chances of success. And I realized that the IA is very much about perspectives and rival perspectives, and that kind of overlaps quite heavily with paper one and those compare and contrast and different judgments. So for each of the topics you teach, going back to that question about compare and contrast, it's quite handy just to reflect on what are the big disagreements between historians on this particular topic? You know, what is the real bone of contention between historian X and Y? And you know, in the actual exam itself, it's a source work paper, and it's very important that the students rely heavily on the sources that they are given rather than just on their background knowledge. But it does help to kind of have a, a little bit of a grounding on what are the big debates between historians on each of the topics you teach, be that paper one, two or three. And I'm building a bit of a database of those for internal assessment possible questions so that students have those ready on the peg to, you know, to be suggested to them if, they, if they're a bit you know, weaker students, for example. Um, and, and back to the sources issue. Sorry, I can't get off that topic. Uh, Kate, uh, also to help you and everybody else, there are cartoon archives uh, that you can use. Sometimes they are difficult to cut and paste or simply impossible. Yeah. But you can give, which is just fine, uh, you, can, you can just give the kids the link and they can look it up online. Um, when writing the move to global war, I found a cartoon database for Republic of China. And I found one also for uh, the Empire of Japan. And so even without you don't even have to translate it because it's really about the imagery and what it's conveying because as you know often this was um, aimed towards people who may not be able to read and write but we know there's a cartoon database for the first world war it's at the firstworldwar.com it's as simple as you can get but you can just sort of get into the into google and just dig up these archives uh, I know that Kent uh, is at Kent University in Britain has a cartoon archive uh, with a lot of David Lowe and uh, in there, which we all love um, as English speakers, but there's a lot going on there. So I'm sure there's one uh, for Russian propaganda and or cartoon, That's German it. propaganda yeah. and so forth. There's tons of this stuff. So get creative and just dig in there and really enjoy that. I love uh, looking for that stuff. Yeah, what I said. Hi. Sorry, go on. Sorry. Andy, this is Kate. I, I just want to follow up on that question. Um, I wrote a bunch of my own paper ones this year uh, for my students this year and last year. And I didn't struggle to find the sources for 1A and B um, or even the sources for the, the OPVL, that was fine. What I struggled with specifically was finding sources um, for the compare contrast that focused on a specific enough topic, but showed different perspectives. So I found myself, when I was writing the papers, I spent, it, it took a long time to write the papers and I was spending most of my time looking for really great sources to use for the compare contrast. I found finding the sources for the rest of it very straightforward. It, it was specifically. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm listening, I swear to God. No, no, that's fine. Uh, it was it was specifically finding something, you know, that focuses on whatever the specific topic is of the paper, like rather than just being moved to global war, like you're you're talking about, I don't know, the applications of fascism in foreign policy or or, or something like that. Like finding the 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 things that that were on a similar topic but but showed both similarities and differences. That's where I ended up spending my time. And I was just wondering if anybody had like tricks or, or tips or suggestions on that, or if the answer is just lots and lots of reading, which is what I did this year. Uh, the answer to that is lots and lots of reading, not to take the wind out of your own sails, but you can also <laughs> do in-text in searches through Questia or through Google Books. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're looking at whatever, Chiang Kai-shek doing something in 1934, then you can just Google search that or Questia search something, Chiang Kai-shek 1934, and that may give it to you. But again, you're not going to find many, every historian has a viewpoint and they're trying to make that argument and they're using their the evidence they've selected to make that point, uh, which of course your students should be aware of. But um, I really think the easiest way to go is to get historians from uh, completely different backgrounds. So if you're looking a Japanese historian versus a Chinese historian or American historian uh, against a German or a Soviet and or Russian, so you that's the, a, the easiest way. And that's still not easy. So good luck with that. Okay, I appreciate that. That's a good point to to consider the different perspectives um, when you're looking for yeah. those sorts. Thank you. When when I was writing the Move to Global War, if you have that book, you'll notice I used quite a few Japanese historians, and that was on yeah. purpose. I, I wanted number one to understand uh, their perspective, not as Japanese people, but as a, a historian who's in Japan. Um, and and I found it very interesting. That some of them agreed with uh, U.S. historians or British historians, and of course some had a completely different perspective because of, of course their access to whatever archives or the time period in which they lived. 
uh, just after the Second World War or before the war. So I think a, a nationality is, I, I think nationalism is crazy uh, and I hate it, but in this case, someone with uh, a context that they've lived in or worked in may give them something uh, a little bit different or something more to add to the story. I, I want to say thank you too. We used that textbook this year and it was, my students thought they were pretty familiar with the time period. They didn't know a lot about Japan. Um, we, we found the textbook really useful and one of my students chose a related topic for her IA um, based on that. So thank you. Yeah, I, I, I really like that the, the, in our last curriculum review that we did that, the Asian perspective versus the same crap, I can't stand it, German Italy. Despite what David may think, I am sick to death of, of Central Europe and the outbreak of the Second World War. I really, I'm so tired of talking about it. I hoped that the IB in the last curriculum would um, not do the typical German, Italian. I was looking for actually uh, French and Polish perspectives of the outbreak of the first war, of the Second World War, uh, but I was the only one making that argument. Um, as well, usual, I'm, as usual, I'm swimming upstream at all times. What were you saying? I was just going to say, based on um, you know some of the the things that we've talked about, we we're doing a curriculum change for this year, um, and I've chosen uh, Rise of Democratic States, and we're using Germany because of the overlap, but we're going to use Japan as well um, because the kids were interested in the stuff we did with Move to Global War, so um, that influenced. We found there's lots of good overlap, which I think will be great for this year, and it was something that they were a little bit familiar with, but not something that they had done to death in middle school. So we're, we're really looking forward to, to those changes this year. Good luck. Thank you. I have, I have something to show to, to David. Can everyone see this? Can you see that, Russell? Uh, I can see it, yeah, just about. I can see swastikas anyway. Just, just the upper part, but uh, not much else. I didn't hear you, David. Say it again. Uh, um, I've seen just the upper part, so swastikas and flags, but... Uh, it's the origins of the Second World War by the deity, A.J.P. Taylor. Uh, it, just happened, it just happened to be here beside me on this table. And the other one is origins of the Second World War in Europe by P.M.H. Bell. So, Kate, another thing that you can actually think about doing is finding books of the same title. Um, and um, as we all know, there's the, the you know, origins of the First World War in Europe, for example, and this is not to be a paper one, but, but uh, by Margaret Macmillan. And then you have 17,000 other books called Origins of the First World War. And each of them have a slightly different perspective. Um, so anyway, enough about that. Um, Thank you. I might ask about that on the forum because I do have some budget um, to spend on, on some supplementary materials. So uh, I, might, I might throw it out to the forum and see what people recommend for, for the stuff we've chosen. I'm a big fan of, of school libraries, so the library often has a large budget. You can give them a list of books that you need and require, you'll tell them, for your school library. Um, often teachers, as someone who is in administration now and who has been head of department in the past, I can tell you so many people don't realize that the library has a budget and, and the heads of department often do not communicate or work closely with the librarian. You should change that and give them directly a, a list of materials you need to supplement your teaching, whether for source material or for just your independent research uh, to enhance your teaching, or for kids to support their internal assessments and so forth and so on. Um, I don't th find it unreasonable that you could request 50 or more books a year, so that may save you some money there. I mean, if I could pitch in, Andy, at this point, um, I, I was going to I, I said as well that in this is a general point, not just in terms of paper one, but all your papers in the IA and the EE. Whenever you're about to teach a new topic or, or revisit a topic, I tend to start just refreshing myself by going into Google and just typing historiography of and then whatever the topic is, just to get a really quick handle on what the main perspectives are on that particular topic because so much of the IB mark schemes, paper one, two, and three, and the IA and the EE are about you know the students evaluating different perspectives on the question they've set themselves. Not just name dropping historians instantly, but just being able to see that different historians have seen it in different ways. And it's a really great way just to get students when they propose an IA to me, for example, I just say, well, type in historiography of that particular topic that you're looking at. Is there any, are there any debates? If there is no debate to be had, on the question immediately, it's, it's, it's a dead end. So I'm just, I'll just type that into the chat window as well while Andy was talking, but I've put that there as well. I wish this chat window would scroll all by itself. It is a bit annoying, isn't it? So by the time I, by the time I really scroll down, I've got 17,000 questions I didn't answer yet. 
Uh, one question was about the extended essay webinar, but that's that, that's in process, isn't it? We're discussing that with Mike Tribe, who's a very experienced extended essay examiner. So he's going to be leading that with uh, me and Andy on the sidelines, really just cheering him on. So just keep keep posted for that one. Um, are there any podcasts on Japanese expanded? I don't know anything. Russell, you're into podcasts. Uh, I don't know of any specifically. I, I did see that there was a very good podcast series, which is a part of the database, which pulls in the, the podcast app, which you refer to. So every day it goes through about 50 different podcasts and pulls in any which have keywords relating to IB topics. And I think there was one which was very heavily focused on um, that area, but the Japanese um, Japanese ones haven't come through yet. As you say, they're focusing a bit too much on G Germany and Italian. But um, I get posted at this full chat when I close down the webinar, and that'll enable me just to quickly identify that question. I'll, I'll have a bit of a search and get back to you on that, Tanya. Yeah. If I can find one. Any final questions? Okay. Well, that brings us to 1820. So I hope you've all found it useful. As I say, what we'll do is we'll upload the video to um, the Active History website. We'll send you the link to the video, to the PowerPoint presentations from me and Andy and resources that we've used today and that crib sheet which we shared with you. And if you do have any other questions that occur to you afterwards, uh, feel free to just reply to my email, which will be through to you tomorrow, no doubt, with the, uh, the links that I've just mentioned. Okay, so if, it's, uh, if that's good and you're right to go, just give us a little wave and Bye-bye. Have a great evening and see you again soon, I hope.